Hello and welcome to Cinema Eclectica, broadcasting to you from the north, but we are uh, authorised to travel down to London if the time is right. <laughs> uh, we are the Geek Show's dedicated movie podcast. I'm Graham and this week I've been joined by Aidan. Hello. And Rob. Hello. And I'm wondering who's just watched the, um, is it a party political broadcast, would you call it that? <laughs> is it the live execution that we've just watched? Um... <laughs> I, I was more yeah, like, yeah. It was Sorry. more like dri- a suicide, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I drive towards Barnard Castle all the time to test my eyesight, Graham. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big castle. If you can see that, you can see anything. I I I I, I marvelled at the. Uh, we stopped off at the forest, and then. <laughs> yeah, there, there was. I'm not saying there was definitely an occult sacrifice going down there, but there was an occult sacrifice going down there. Maybe mm. he just needed a poo. <laughs> <laughs> Occam's razor, um, mate. Occam's razor. <laughs> just, I would just love say. it if that's what this whole controversy ended up as. <laughs> they dug up the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're saying is this is going to turn out to be a really weird road trip movie. <laughs> it is, yes. A sort of fascist Jim Jarmusch film. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I want to see that now. <laughs> Anyway, uh, our, our, our theme for this week is not road movies. God, if only we'd have known this was coming. Um, but it oh, oh, I saw what you did there. Uh, I, I didn't even realise I'm doing this. It's just occupying my brain. <laughs> my big domed skull. Uh this week we are doing an idea that I've had in the drafts for ages. It's bad adaptations, a look at movies which have not entirely played fair by their source material. I think it would be fair to say. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, well, there are many, many, yeah, many. And uh, when you asked me about this uh, yesterday... <laughs> Mm, yes. Well, post literary loitering recording, uh, mm. I I said I deal with I deal with like comics and cartoons and manga, and I know more than most people <laughs> when it comes yes. to bad adaptations of just things. Yeah, but for now, let's dig into the shot. <laughs> <laughs> The three mountains of chud that we have <laughs> waiting us. Oh, anybody got a shovel? <laughs> I'll settle for the lobo. So this was kind of fun for me, because uh, like Prop, I also do literary loitering elsewhere on the Geek Show podcast network. So I'm, we are, I think, well positioned to talk about the connection between books and films. Yes. I've been thinking a lot about a film which I remember being advertised when I was in my early teens, and it's for some reason it's always lodged into my head as the platonic ideal of a bad adaptation, even though until yesterday I hadn't seen this. It's Roland Joffe's 1995 adaptation of Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's a yeah. Um, continue. It's a pull. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this came out at the time when it starred Demi Moore was inescapable, and I think whatever she did that year, she'd have been cut down to size. I have a certain degree of sympathy for her in that regard. I too have flown too close to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to ask, is it Demi Moore? Demi Moore? What is it? I've, I've <laughs> always heard it as Demi. That's what I've always heard. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've heard, I think I've heard a similar thing. It's like, kind of like tomato or tomato. See, I, yes. uh, I, thought, I, I thought it was short for Dimitra or something like that, which is it, a Greek name. Probably. Yeah. Um, and all of the Greek lasses I know who use that as kind of a nickname pronounce it Demi. So I bow to your superior Greek know-how. Um, 
I think I knew one Greek person when I was at uni, uh, and he had no real opinion on the demi demi controversy. Well, it's I mean, if you walked up to Hercules and said, "Are you a demi god?" <laughs> you'd probably get yeah. a punch. <laughs> That's a that's a way of framing the problem I would never have come up with on my own. <laughs> but yes, she's in it, and it was part of her bad 1995. The other half of it was striptease, which is, I mean, it was absolutely monster at the time. Uh, yeah. It's did, sort of been forgotten did, now. Did, did striptease come out the same time as Showgirls? Yeah, that's it was about the, the same thing. time. Yeah. It did, and I, I think that's probably why it's been forgotten that its status as the alpha mid nineties strip club themed disaster was quick. You'd think that would be the sort of specialised category you'd always have to yourself, but yeah. Uh... See, the problem with striptease when it went up against showgirls was striptease went, hmm, let's do it like uh, le- le- let's just go close to the line, but not far enough over the line to like shock people where mm. and then showgirls turned up and everyone went boobs <laughs> <laughs> i think i've probably mentioned this before on the show but showgirls was an absolutely vital step towards me becoming a functional mature adult because i remember when it came out and everyone said oh god it's really unsexy i thought yeah well they're just saying that it's got boobs of course it's sexy <laughs> and then i watched it and thought no, this is actually really unsexy. I feel like I've become an adult today. <laughs> I mean, if, if you if you go back and watch Showgirls now, it literally is. I think I told you about this, Graham. I went mm. to I went to see Le Mis, um and uh, the theatre is on the corner of Shaftesbury Avenue, and there's like this acute angled corner. And then yeah, I'm looking. I'm in the queue waiting to buy a ticket to go and see Lemis. And I'm looking straight at the main entrance of the theatre, and then just off to the right is this neon sign that says "Live Show Sexy Girls." Right. <laughs> and it's about as it, it's showgirls to me is that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think the difference between things like uh, striptease and the Scarlet Letter that showgirls didn't have is that they are designed as star vehicles and Demi Moore's naked body had been like an inescapable presence in American media for the first half of the 1990s. It had this, what what now is quite a rare uh, response they got now that uh, most popular films are essentially fairly sexless but that you have this star this sex symbol at the prime of her fame and she was taking her clothes off and people were going oh god not again put them back on (laughs) just just we've seen it all now (laughs) yeah and striptease is based on a Carl Hyacin novel, and Carl Hyacin deserves a bit better than that. But uh, the Scarlet Letter, the Scarlet Letter is based on a Nathaniel Hawthorne novel, and I've got to say, I was never wild on the Scarlet Letter when I read it at university. It does begin with, at uh, least like the edition I read, begins with quite a long preface. Uh, in which Hawthorne explains why the book needed to be written. And I think if you have to start a book by explaining why it should have been written, you've already played defence, aren't you? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I do think it has certain things that interest me more as I sort of look back at it. And one of the things is how Hester Prynne, its heroine, develops once she's been cast out of society. Because everyone knows Scarlet Letter. Uh, Hester Prynne is caught in Puritan, Massachusetts. She's had an affair. There's a kid. And she gets a big Scarlet A sewn into her dress so that all of the townspeople know that she's a big old skank and they have to avoid her. But one of the interesting things about Hawthorne's novel, compared with Joffé's film is that Hester Prynne is actually quite a conformist character up until she's cast out by society in Hawthorne's novel. She's someone who is not a natural opponent of Puritanism. It's only when she's taken outside of society that she begins to think in a more religiously nonconformist way. 
And you could say that the whole story is kind of an origin story from America, for America, how it got from Puritanism to the kind of mix of religious traditions that the founding fathers had, and then flipped back again. But that's another story. So there's a, there's a lot to chew on there. The problem with the Scarlet Letter, just as as a book to adapt, is that once you've had this incident that kicks everything off. Hester goes off into the wilderness and mulls over religion, and the Reverend Dimmersdale just sits around feeling ever more guilty for himself. And, you know, in a film, people kind of have to do stuff. Yeah. So that's a bit of a pitfall. It's telling that the Scarlet Letter has... It's racked up its highest number of adaptations in the silent era when you could make a perfectly good film based on nothing but a series of good set pieces and one memorable visual. Uh, the Silent Eva famously is when Ingmar Bergman's mentor, Victor Sjöström, made his version of The Scarlet Letter, which has been cited as the best screen version by no less a literary scholar than Emma Stone in the film Easy A. I think I remember hearing that somewhere, actually. I can't remember... Oh. Yes. Yeah, I think I remember... <laughs> Easy A is fantastic, I want to say. Easy A is a much better adaptation of The Scarlet Letter than this. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fair point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I realise it sounds like I'm damning it with faint praise, but I love Easy A. You see, one of the problems you've got in the Demi Demi, let's call the whole thing off, Moo version is that when Hester arrives in colonial Eva America, she is already set against the locals. She gets off in this ridiculous sort of wide-brimmed hat, which one critic at the time said looked like the sort of thing Sophia Loren would be wearing in 1966. And immediately sort of starts loudly insisting that she is an independent free spirit. She has a bath, which I, I was not aware was as much of a problem back then, but there's an absolutely ridiculous moment when her servant is just staring horrified at it, and she goes, "'Tis not an instrument of Satan, tis a bath." So, yeah, it's it's going to take more than a few strategically deployed tizzes to make this dialogue sound period appropriate. <laughs> So she has bath and get quite a lot of the first like hour or so of the film is taken up with Demi Moore rubbing herself in the bath while thinking about Gary Oldman's ass, which <laughs> Oh, did you have to? <laughs> there is a lot of Oldman ass in this film. Not old man ass, although <laughs> the differential between the two grows narrower every passing God, year. God, imagine trying to Google that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I'm not getting the pictures together for a written review of this. Oh, wow. And, you know, I think the ideal time to watch something like this would be when you're about 12 or 13. Uh, the internet hasn't been invented yet, and uh, or at least isn't very good. And you're just scanning late night television for something that might have sex in it. Because if you watch it any older than that, you will watch Demi Moore and Gary Oldman's sex scene and just be thinking about the practicalities all the way through. They have sex in a sort of barn on top of a huge pile of wheat and grain. Which, and... Um... <laughs> I know many people from farming communities, and uh, I have it on good authority that it gets everywhere. It's <laughs> almost it. as yes. bad as sand. It's <laughs> almost <laughs> yes. as bad as sand, okay? <laughs> well, you mentioned sand. It's just brought it home to me that this is the one script which could do with having a polish from George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not the most sensual of environments, is it? <laughs> it's not. All you can think is you'll be pulling it out of there for months. Oh, wow. <laughs> Fortunately, she has her bath, so, you know, it's, it's not as much of a problem. But there seems to be this desire to make the Scarlet Letter work as a kind of sexy forbidden period romance which I think is, is not an unworkable take on the story but it's hamstrung by the fact that no one making this thing 
can quite decide how seriously they want to take Puritan Massachusetts. I mean, they certainly don't want to take it seriously enough that the second half of the movie is actually Demi Moore and Gary Oldman sitting around thinking about their sins. And sure enough, that is not what happens in the second half of the movie. Oh my God, is it not? (laughs) Um, But there's also no real teeth to the depiction of the society. I mean, you would think that anyone having profane or unbiblical thoughts in this environment would watch their tongue. But as I've said, Moa just goes around blabbing out her nonconformism to anyone who will listen. There's a brief attempted moment of threat when Joan Plowright, Dame Joan Plowright, everyone, Laurence Olivier's widow, uh, plays a sort of colonial elder who says that, you know, I've heard you've been having unwholesome thoughts about the Reverend and Moore freezes and then Plowright is just, I can't remember the exact dialogue, but something like, ha ha, psych, gotcha, he's a solid eight. I loved him in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Anyway, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, I do think the Scarlet Letter, the movie, would have been improved <laughs> if that was actually said. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, I think the Scarlet Letter would be improved if that was actually said. So you, you've set this thing up, and it's a thing where if you are remotely serious about the story that you have created here, it can only go in two directions. The first is the Hawthorne direction, where everyone just comes to terms with what they've done in their own way, uh, which is fine as a novel. But it's a movie. People need to do something. The second would be if this society of remarkably nonconformist Puritans think, oh, actually, this seems a bit harsh on old Hester. Let's have a rebellion, which could be fun. But I think most people would be aware that doesn't really happen in Puritan Massachusetts. So you have to go route three, which is just throw everything at it and hope to God that it resolves in some way in the end. Yeah, hope for something that will stick. Yeah. and mm, Poo sticks. <laughs> <laughs> Coincidentally, this is exactly what they've come up with. We are told that Moore's husband uh, has died in a shipwreck, which clears the way for her to have this affair with the local reverend. Aha, but it turns out he's alive. And he's played by, and get this for someone you never thought you'd see as one half a screen couple with Demi Moore, Robert Duvall. Wait, 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 wait. Just, <laughs> just hold on. Consigliere Tom Hagen, Robert Duvall. <laughs> Hang on, hang on, hang on. We, we were having Hugh prob- Radley, Robert Duvall. <laughs> we were having problems with old man ass already. <laughs> it's not quite clear how they met. I assume they were the old high school sweethearts, obviously. Um, but she was in first grade and he was on an incubator in the local hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, And this is kind of staggering because really what you're about to see in the Scarlet Letter is something that scientists always knew was theoretically possible on a quantum level, but we never thought we could actually see it in the wild. You are about to see a bad Robert Duvall performance. I didn't even know such a thing could exist, to be honest with you. Um, there There are films... In the wilds, you'll find them if you look hard enough. I, I like it, and I could not imagine it. I cannot think of anyone who I would say is more reliable than Robert Duvall. Everyone's yet, got an off day. <laughs> everyone has an off day. In, in Robert Duvall's case, he has a solid like 60 years of bad performances that are all coming out in this one film. He's stored it all up. <laughs> It's a, it's a good job it didn't sort of spill out in Apocalypse Now. Um, uh, hang on. Are you saying the Scarlet Letter is Robert Duvall's performance diarrhea? <laughs> <laughs> Scarlet Letter is to Robert Duvall what that forest is to Dominic Cummings. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, wow. He is just absolutely inexplicable. And I mean, the script doesn't help. It's all about her husband finding out that she's had this kid with the Reverend and going on a revenge mission, but killing the wrong man. You'll remember all this, of course, from uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's classic novel, Death Wish. (laughs) There's a subplot about the local Algonquin Indians, which I think is just bizarre. I mean, I suppose if I squint and try and act charitable, you can say this is part of the early 90s Dances with Wolves, uh, Last of the Mohicans kind of zeitgeist, where people revisited these historic American stories and tried to give the natives some uh, place at the table. But as it is, the Algonquins are just here to scalp people, so who cares? Again, scalping's another ingredient that I think we all remember from Nathaniel Hawthorne's <laughs> The Scarlet Letter. Wow. Oh dear. I mean... For the first hour, there is the sense that this could work. It has a score by John Barry. And, I mean, John Barry is mainly remembered now for his James Bond work and fair play. That's fantastic. John Barry also, I think, has this knack, like Morricone does, of being able to do a big, soupy, omnipresent romance film score and have it work. Mm. And I think this one does work. And, you know, there are other points of promise in it uh, once he's got his trousers on I think Gary Oldman's performance is actually good and I know he's quite fond of it himself the performance not the backside I don't know he might like that um, <laughs> maybe <laughs> so there, there are points of quality but it's all capsized by this insane collapse into scalpings and revenge missions and people mysteriously surviving shipwrecks and Duval going absolutely bug-eyed mental in a way that, uh, you know, makes his his enjoyably OTT performance in Steve McQueen's Widows look even yeah. better than it already did. So y- you think, what is this? Why did this happen? And at the time, people thought it's pretty obvious why it happened. It happened because Demi Moore wanted an Oscar vehicle and also wanted to make a movie that delivered everything the public had expected from the star of Striptease. And the result was this mess. And that's a seductive theory. Seductive, but I think false. For the real culprit... I think you should look at the opening credits, which has as executive producer Dodie Fayed. Really? Making this the second biggest car crash he was ever involved in. Oh, wow, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> now, I knew very little about Dodie Fayed except for the obvious, but there is an anecdote in Tom Bauer's biography of Muhammad Fayed which says that he'd been trying to get into film production since the very early 80s, so early that he once saw a rough cut of new British film in the about, about 1980, 81 sort of time, which he was being asked for completion funds for. And it was everything he didn't want for his putative career as a movie mogul. There was no action. There was no sex. There was no fighting or violence. You know, this whole thing just had no appeal to him. And that movie found funding elsewhere and it was released. And it was Chariots of Fire. Wow. (laughs) That's a pretty big thing to miss. Yeah. um, But I mean... (laughs) It's not hard to get into movies during the 80s. Oh, sorry. It wasn't that hard if you had enough money, which he did at the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure it's still pretty easy. And that's why, you know, 10, 15 years later, you have a version of The Scarlet Letter, which absolutely feels like it was produced by someone who watched a rough cut of Chariots of Fire and thought, where are the sex scenes? <laughs> See, I mean, everything you've described, Graham, in, even about Muhammad Fayed watching the rough cut of Chariots of Fire, all of that <laughs> just, it, it plays into my view of Hollywood executives in oh, general. Yeah. 
Um, so do you, yeah. So do you think like uh, Fayed just looked at Chariot of Fire and just went, "Yes, we need to Tintal brass the shit out of this place." <laughs> <laughs> I did think of Tintal brass when I was watching this. I mean, it it is one of the more bum fixated films I've seen outside of Tintal brasses. Uh, although I don't think Gabby Oldman would really be up to Tintal brasses usual standards for uh, <laughs> yeah, but, exposure. But, but then again, you know, maybe what maybe. Maybe what Chariots of Fire needed was uh, a fair degree of brass rubbing. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! I mean, here all I'm here all episode. <laughs> regrettably, <laughs> I mean you can't discount Roland Joffe's influence on it because he was coming off a shocking career streak. He too would have this fantasy of being a mogul, and uh, he decided to buy up a property which he thought was was big it was talked about and yet it wasn't something that anyone else would think a film could be made of and that was super mario brothers oh didn't he also destroy goldcrest when he was working on the mission with al pacino that was hugh hudson uh the director of chariot fire so maybe dodie fired you know had his head put on straight when he did that but yeah not a glowing time for the British film industry, the 1980s. No, definitely not. <laughs> While you were still learning how to spell your name! But anyway, uh, I understand you've got something, Aiden. <laughs> yeah, from moving on from eroticism, I should say, I am going into the subject of Scientology next. <laughs> Hooray! I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I'm probably not going to dwell on this for too long, this intro, this rambling intro, but I have to review Battlefield Earth. Excellent. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, based on the novel by L. Ron Hubbard, who... Um, now, I, I'm hoping some people will clue me on on this, because I've never read the novel, and mm. nor will I ever will. I but have. I've, yeah, <laughs> oh <I'm> wow! Getting... <laughs> but uh, I, I was young and stupid. I had no idea who Elron Hubbard was. I, just I was saw young. This... I was stupid. They hooked me up to an e-meter to read my engrams. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I, I this was before I'd gone to university. Before I'd moved to London. Before I discovered what the Church of Scientology was. Um, <laughs> and because uh, my first introduction to them was when my bro- they had a they had a shop on uh, Tottenham Court Road. Uh, mm-hmm. In 1994, and uh, my brother, who was crashing in my hall's residence with me at the time, uh, he said, "Let's get our personalities tested." And I went, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> but before Literally then, that peep show episode, <laughs> it really yeah. is. But before then, I'd read battle <laughs> a few books from Battlefield Earth because I was heavily into sci-fi, and it seemed seemed like an interesting read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um because that's the perfect anecdote I would describe it because when the book got released it got well pretty much how the film received its reception it got an awful lot of bad reviews and press around it. Mm. But it did have a lot of supporters behind it and one of the supporters was one John Travolta. Yes. Mm. Now John Travolta this was a passion project for him for such a such a long time he tried to get it off the ground millions of times but couldn't get the financing for it until mm. I think towards the late 90s when he got up, when he approached franchise pictures who will go into a bit more of their history later on down the review because it, it, it's spectacular to say the, <laughs> the least um but anyway, uh, Battlefield Earth yes based on the novel by Alan Hubbard um set in the year 3000 so a good 1,000 years into the uh, modern history, I would Did say. Did anything change? Uh, were people living underwater? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and was John Revolta's great-great-great-granddaughter pretty fine? I busted Scientologists. <laughs> Is this a scandal we can unearth on Cinema Eclectica? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sure it is. <laughs> well, anyway, we, we open on um, Barry Pepper as to, known as a character called, and I'm not joking, this is his actual name in the film. Barry Pepper plays a character called Johnny Goodboy Tyler. Um, 
And what we learn from him is that mankind has pretty much gone extinct. So there's been some kind of nuclear holocaust that we don't know much about, to be perfectly honest with you. Hmm. But Johnny Goodboy Tyler turns out to be, get ready for this, a long-haired caveman living <laughs> in the Alps of God knows where, Colorado, Denver, whatever. And um, he goes out to adventure into the outside world, per se. So um, he's often greeted with his fellow tribe about the horrors of like monsters being out there, grueling sci-fi monstrosities. But the mm. thing is, is that one of the monsters that he is really frightened about, or the beast as they dub it, turns out to be a mini golf dragon planted <laughs> in the middle of like this field far away. Covered in moss, which turns out to be the least threatening thing that I've seen in my life. <laughs> and it's such a strange concept to behold, really, because, you know, this is like the beginning that I noticed that I was going to be in for a bumpy ride, really. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's just... What? No, um, yeah, you're and, right. The books are as the books are just as bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and... Judging from that anecdote, I, I'm not entirely surprised by that. But meanwhile, you know, you know, Johnny bumps into um, a couple more cavemen from a different tribe. I seem to gather, and one of the film's main, one of the film's many problems is that it has a very hard time establishing language. Now, when I say this, is because the cavemen, you know, don't have concept of what you know English might be, so that they use euphemisms or phrases like "piece of cake" and stuff like that. <laughs> um, and so immediately they switch from making monkey noises with spears to perfectly phrased English in a matter of like seconds, <laughs> really. And it's so bizarre because you can't really comprehend that fact. And once we get into like the main threat, which later goes down the line, it'll become more of a problem. Hmm. So then we bump into um eventually they bump into like the main alien antagonists of uh, battlefield earth known as cyclos now just, where does he get these crazy names from i realize this sounds lamer than the worst of doctor who villains <laughs> <laughs> no 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 just just wait for the makeup <laughs> yeah <laughs> wait for that because what because the main well, main spearhead is played by John Travolta himself, known as the Alien Turl. Now, what do these Cyclos look like? And eventually the Cyclos do capture, like, Johnny and the remaining tribes people. I'll get onto that in a little bit as well. Um, Turl is dressed as, and get ready for this, because if you think, like, the name Cyclo is the lamest thing you're ever going to hear, wait until you see them, because they are eight-foot-tall extraterrestrial Bob Marleys. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, a little bit more than that. Um, uh, see, the the way it, it, it's an accurate description, uh, I'll say I don't buy no Bob Marley's more than just Bob Marley's. Yeah, not <laughs> there. Forrest Whitaker's in there. No, no, yeah, Forrest Whitaker's. Um, John Travolta looks like a really badly drawn furry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And. You're just gawking at the design of it because each and every single one of those cyclos are just as ugly as the last one. I mean, mm. there's one cyclo who has a chin for a toilet seat, another <laughs> that looks like a reject version of the Cowardly Lion from I, The Wizard I, of Oz. I'm just I'm still stuck working out the first one. He's got a chin for a toilet seat. Our toilet seat for a chin, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, I was trying to work out the physics of that. <laughs> honestly you'll be questioning the physics throughout battlefield earth because honest to god it's got to be one of the hideous looking films i've ever seen in my life mm. because it, this film is notorious for um its cinematography now the cinematography is like it i would say like a good 99 percent of this movie it feels like it anywhere is mm. shot on dutch angles now, if you don't yes. know what Dutch Angles is, it's that it's slightly tilted, so that slanted shots, really, all the dang time. And I am quoting the director, Mr. Roger Christiansen, here, and the reason for this is, and I'm directly quoting, is that he wanted the film to look like a comic book. I mean, that's quite daring, considering it's a literal holy vit for one <laughs> of your stars. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you just consider the fact that it isn't really, because... First of all, when we look at comic book adaptations 
or how directors nowadays present comic books. It's a lot more than just tilting your shot every five seconds. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, for example, you know, directors like Sam Raimi, James Gunn, or Josh Whedon have this in their strides because it's much more than that. You know, it's about how you position the camera, movements, panning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What year was um, Battlefield Earth? Sorry, what year was Battlefield Earth? Two thousand. Okay, saga so of the year two thousand. Was it post Batman? Forever? I'm pretty sure it was, yes. Right, okay. <laughs> then he's got no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you just really think, well, this doesn't add up at all. And you just end up with this dizzying nausea because all the shots in this film are bathed in these horrible lurid colours that you can't help but gawk at half the mm. time. So a lot of greens, sun-dried yellows. It, it doesn't look pleasant at all and really, really damning ugly. But I, I think one of the things that I'm dancing around with Battlefield Earth is that I'm, one of the main problems that I, I think a lot of people have of it is that it just makes no sense whatsoever. Nope. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely zero sense whatsoever. Because w- when you look at science fiction in general, like, say, Star Wars, for example, normally they'll have this fantastic sense of world building or star trek for example Mm. that when you spot a plot hole incoming normally it's like quite minuscule in first glance so what i'm saying is on your first viewing you know plot holes like glide past your head really yeah yeah um battlefield earth has no world building whatsoever so all the cyclos in this movie have used like english you know phrases half the time like you know when Turl, the leading alien played by John Travolta, goes up to like the bar and says, put a tab on my pint or something like that. Yes. And you just think, well, that's not very convincing in the slightest of things. But then when that world building attempts, attempts to open up, the plot holes reveal themselves. And I'm not joking, the plot holes are the size of a blooming crater. Mm. For example, um, to I, I'm t- trying to glide through my notes, trying to make sense of this as I'm, you know, going. Yes, but um, one of the re- one of the reasons why Johnny is like so revered is because you know the cyclos think they are stupid enough to um, you know, believe in them. So, say for example, uh, despite the fact that they have clearly know about the human civilization because they can see their architecture, the cyclos, they can see, you know, what they can do. They haven't heard one of the main reasons why they have to, you know, one of the main reasons why they came to Earth, for example, is that they have to mine for gold. And yet mm. they have never heard of a place called Fort Knox in their life. Right. Which yes. is one of the main sticking points of this movie. They have to go to Fort Knox to, like, obviously mine for gold or get the gold for the Cyclos. Despite the fact that never, I don't think they ever established why they need the gold in the first place. Mm. So then you have the sequence, like, John Travolta tries to pick up Johnny, put him in this, like, machine to learn him of the Cyclo knowledge, essentially. So, in essence, it's kind of like the Matrix, where he just, this machine just beams knowledge into his head. Now, my question is here, why would you give your enemy that advantage? Why would you give human beings who you clearly can't trust whatsoever, you know, you constantly refer to them as rat brains or anything like that, beam this knowledge into his head, and then immediately, like, Johnny goes to inmates in, in, like, this prison and begin drawing, like, these mathematic equations and diagrams into the the prison walls and, you know, floors. (laughs) Because he's a genius. <laughs> but why give him that advantage? Because he's a good boy. Yes. They want to make him clever so he, he can appreciate them patting him on the head. Oh, God. <laughs> that book I got you for uh, Christmas is taking on a whole new meaning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I didn't picture Barry Pepper as any of the dogs that you bought me in that book. But, uh, yeah, that's a kind of family resemblance. <laughs> The, uh, so, the book's titled <laughs> in the book is called "What I Lick Before Your Face." <laughs> <laughs> and levels uh, that's on the level of logic we have in this movie, and there's plenty more examples in there. I mean, th- there's a sequence where Barry Pepper and the other cavemen to fight back against the Cyclos on the planet Cyclo and the mm. base that they have in Denver. By the way, we explicitly told that their base on Earth is in Denver. Okay. <laughs> 
which is a weird prod that I have no understanding why it's there. But anyway, there's a bit in this where, to fight back against them, they find this base. Need I remind you, is set in the year 3000, mm. and all of the fighter jets are in pristine condition, the lighting <laughs> still works, and to obviously learn the ins and outs of how to handle the fighter jets is by one lesson of flight simulation that's somehow also still working in the same base. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> I mean, they're well-made planes. They built things to last back then. What a... Who wrote this? How Elrond this Hubbard. <laughs> Elrond yes. Hubbard wrote it. The man who, in an interview, the year before he released Dianetics, said, if I want to make a million dollars, I'll start my own religion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you have all these massive leaps of logic that I cannot understand for me whatsoever. The acting, on the other hand, is like like completely hammy, as you would expect. I mean... Mm. One of, like, the strangest performances ever that I've seen from John Travolta, because I, I know I've realised I've wailed on him before. You may remember Gotti that I reviewed a couple of years back, where... Oh, yes. Bad, um, but at least that is a stereotype... I, I, I hate saying this. It's a stereotype of Italian gangsters, yes. Was and this, it has more... Was this stranger than his performance in Swordfish? I can't remember Swordfish for the life of me, but... Jesus Christ. I mean, half the time he talks in colonial British is an albino Rastafarian on stilts, <laughs> may I remind you. Yes. Okay, yeah, going... Battlefield Earth takes it. <laughs> <laughs> and then just com completely ham fists his dialogue all the time. Like, no matter when he's in the bar saying to Forrest Whitaker's character, while you were still learning how to spell your name, I was being trained to conquer galaxies and you know, crap like that, which has got to be like one of the most worst Shakespearean monologues I've ever heard that was not <laughs> penned by Shakespeare. Mm. Um, and it just rolls with it on that lo logic. I mean, Barry Pepper, half the time in this movie, and, you know, he's acted fine in other movies. I mean, this is the film that really ended his career. But, no, he's acted decently in other films, like, namely, like, the Corn Brothers re uh, version of True Grace, where he played Ned yes. Pepper. Yeah. He was pretty good in that. And then, most of the time here he spends, like, they don't really utilise him well at all, and half the time he's, like, talking in this sometimes oddly Scottish dialect that I can't quite understand where it came from. Oh, man, I would love there to be some obscure Scientology clause that says after the apocalypse we all become Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's this bizarre moment of characterization where Johnny um, is in prison, right? And then begins to talk to his fellow inmates about um, how they should handle, like, this weird sludge that they have to eat for food. Mm. Now, the, um, you know, the main, like, spearhead of the prisoner gang just immediately says to him, you know, me and my get men eat first, you'll get the scraps later or what's left of it. And then he pre Barry Pepper proceeds to beat the living snot out of him <laughs> put his head in the vat of sludge, pulls him out again, and then immediately says to the crowd, you know, we should not act like savages over food. When clearly he just demonstrated that. Yes. <laughs> so, he's not utilised at all. Forrest Whitaker has the expression, the most depressed expression on his face throughout the whole of the movie, where... He seems to have the expression of, I am firing my agent immediately after the production <laughs> has finished. <laughs> he doesn't look like he's happy at all. I mean, there's one sequence where Turl, the John Travolta's character, fires off, shoots off his hand. And mm. then one of the things is that for Cyclos is that they don't have pain threshold at all. So he kind of like gawks at his like, left hand immediately in an expression like, oh my God, someone has just dropped my ice cream sundae dinner. <laughs> or something like that. It, that seems to be his expression on his face, rather than crying out in pain. It, it, it's not properly handed at all, and it's just. I'm struggling to really comprehend that we live on a planet where Battlefield Earth exists. To be honest with you, because, <laughs> well, that's the problem with living on a planet which was famously used as a prison by hyper advanced beings before uh, society evolved back when it was called TGAC. <laughs> it's, 
it's a mind-numbing film because near enough the whole craft of it's wrong the acting is wrong the plot holes as i mentioned before you'll fall through them in a matter of minutes mm. and it's just mind-numbing to a point where it's it, honestly it's honestly the cinematic equivalent of a brain hemorrhage <laughs> <laughs> Not fun in the slightest. But unbelievably but, happy. But Aiden, is it as bad as the Super Mario Brothers movie? Now I haven't seen the Super Mario <laughs> Brothers movie. Um, <laughs> oh, that's going to be adventure, an adventure for you. Yes, <laughs> I imagine it will. And you know, this leads me back to franchise pictures because franchise pictures, obviously, when this tanked in the year two thousand, franchise pictures obviously decided to pick up the grounds from that, and then there was this massive, massive lawsuit against them. They're claiming that they fraudulently inflated the budget of this film and numerous other examples. So <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that of course they lost that lawsuit and ended up bankrupting them. So what I'm saying is, is that Battlefield Earth was financed by thieves and made by. <laughs> and made by idiots. <laughs> While you were still learning how to spell your name! that That's actually a great, great segue. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, for mine, see, I, I had all sorts of options to choose from, hmm. but we are currently going through the coronavirus pandemic. Pandemic, not epidemic. Pandemic, hmm. right? Yeah. And I thought, hmm. hmm, I seem to remember a movie that came out that was called A Certain Thing, but had absolutely, aside from the title, had absolutely no relation to the book it was based on in any way, shape, or form. Okay. So, the movie in question is, and I'm just going to read this little bit from the Wikipedia page, right? It is an American apocalyptic film directed by Mark Foster with a screenplay by, wait for it, Matthew Michael Carnahan, Drew Goddard and Damon Lindelof from a screen story by Carnahan and J. Michael Straczynski based on the 2006 novel of the same name by Max Brooks. So, ah, I am talking about World War Z. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Neil yeah. filmed in Stockton. <laughs> yes. Now the oh film, the film stars, as everyone knows, Brad Pitt because it was on the posters, and he was the only person named on the poster. <laughs> <laughs> it just said Brad Pitt, World War Z, and just pictures of him looking forlorn with his scarf. Which <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether he's the hero or the scarf is, but <laughs> the scarf did get some screen time. <laughs> But yes, um, now I want to ask: Have either of you two read World War Z or World War have. Z? And neither right. have I. No. Okay, right. World War Z, the book. And when people say this has no rela- this film has no relation to the book, they're not kidding, right? Mm. <laughs> See, the movie is its stereotypical zombie action flick. Brad Pitt plays the role of Jerry Lane, who is some. He used to work for the UN, but it's never quite clear what job his, uh, what role his actual job was. You know what he actually did. All you know is that at the beginning of the story, he says to his kids, "I'm never going to leave you for work again." I used to be coffee and nan. <laughs> but then you know, obviously, he has to leave for work again because otherwise, the film <laughs> wouldn't make any progress. And yes. there's a zombie apocalypse with zombies who seem to have, you know, they seem to have realized that hard mode in video games is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like a tidal wave of zombies coming at you. You're just like, yeah, let's run, but we can't outrun the zombies because they're like ridiculously fast. It's like a bunch of, it's like you said, bolt multiplied, then became zombified and start running after us. <laughs> he's got old, <laughs> He's got endless stamina. <laughs> so you know, uh, 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 an overweight guy like me, I'd be screwed in that kind of zombie apocalypse. But it's a weird thing, isn't it? Fast zombies. I just always find myself sitting there thinking, what did they do? Calisthenics <laughs> when they were in the grave or something? <laughs> so, so to uh, combat like the Olympics, they would jack themselves up on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the thing. I mean, the film is literally made as your typical zombie apocalypse movie. 
And I think part of it might have been inspired by the repeated Resident Evil movies and mm. all of the other zombie apocalypse movies like 28 mm. Days Later and 28... I Am, I am Legend, yeah. And I Am Legend yeah. and stuff like that. And I think I think what they were looking at was, you know, how can we make zombies scarier? Mm. Let's a make them scarier. kind of way. Yeah, in a PG-13 kind of way. Let's make them scarier, but let's do it without any of the blood and any of the gore and anything like that. So let's <laughs> go for real shock value. Do you know? And then someone at the meeting just went, what about a tidal wave? Tidal wave of zombies, that's it. That, that will go with that. See, <laughs> some straight-to-video producer would have made that and called it zombie tsunami. Or something. <laughs> yeah. In a similar way, they make Sharknado. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it would have been terrible, but it wouldn't have cost $200 million. So who's laughing now? Exactly. Because initially, the estimated budget was only like $125 million, but then the costs started going up. Because, <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I mean... <laughs> Right. I'm not going to go into the problems with the filming because mm. that's 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 a different matter. I'm not going to go into the problems with the screenplay because that's another matter, and it'd take like half an episode to go through all that. But yeah. there were a lot of production problems with World War Z. Suffice to say, the author wasn't happy with the direction it was going. <laughs> no. <laughs> but anyway, um, so. Brad Pitt is doing his best Joey Tribbiani acting in this film. <laughs> <laughs> right, I have to say, this is not his best role by a long way. And <laughs> there are a lot of scenes where it literally looks like he's he's looking around trying to figure out who farted. <laughs> Was there no moment where Brad Pitt goes to the zombies saying, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I wish he did. It would have made this film so much better. <laughs> right. See, this is the thing, right? When you go to watch a when you go to watch a film like this, you want to be entertained, but you also want something with a bit of an edge. Yeah? Yeah. Uh but but it seems like you know JJ was it JJ Abrams did a version of Dawn of the Dead or was it someone else? Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know I, where that's lifted from. Yeah, but I, I know I can't resist. I, I couldn't remember who it was. I just knew it was a, a director who I have no real respect for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Zack Snyder's version of Dawn of the Dead tried to make it more rock and roll, would you say? More cool? More stylish? Yeah, kind of more actiony, y and political and Zack Snyder, I would say. Yeah, hmm. um, and that's exactly what they've done with World War Z because the first thing you notice about this film, right, when hmm. you when you finish the film, the very first thing you you notice about it is it's very 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 USA USA USA. <laughs> We're gonna save the world. Brad Pitt's gonna save the world. He was he's a USA man. He's a USA man. And our best <laughs> uh, and the USA's best friends, obviously Israel, are also mm -hmm. in there saving the world. When in the book, it's kind of what's happening in the real world right now. <laughs> in the everyone thing. Well, if this predicts that New Zealand turn out to be the best at everything, that's going to be incredible. Yeah, but the thing is, <clears throat> in, the, in the book, right? Uh, the mm. book is is a damning satirical because um, the book is told from the perspective of a UN of a UN uh, of UN guy who's going around getting interviews from people who lived through a war that happened over the course of like ten years and is still kind of ongoing, right? Yeah. And it's it's mm. basically recording how people's lives have changed and the things people had to do to get away from to basically fight against the zombie apocalypse, which didn't affect everywhere. It was a global pandemic that basically affected everywhere in the same way the coronavirus has. It crept up on people. It was a looming threat that didn't go away. And so yeah. 10, 20 years on, it's still there. People are still dealing with it. But some countries escaped unscathed. But the Americans, because of their arrogance and their hubris, didn't. I mean, the Battle of Yonkers, is, it doesn't even make the film. And it's like the most important battle in the story because the American government decided to have a pitched battle in Yonkers, New York, against the zombies and lose horribly and this is right. li this is broadcast live on tv mm. <laughs> and they lose horribly and you know i uh, when we talked about shovels earlier and i mentioned the lobo 
the American soldiers have to relearn different ways of fighting because their guns aren't as effective. So they develop a new wef- weapon, which is a, a which is kind of like a combat shovel, so right. they, uh, called a lobo, because you can lob the heads off zombies, and then you uh, can basically uh, scoop them up and shove them on a pile to be burned. Yeah, things like that. The book has all sorts of things like they drop prison. The, you know, the prisoner population of the planet takes a hit because they drop them in as bait for zombies, so they can distract them and get other things done. None of yeah. that makes the film, right? No. The film is very, very PG-13, very, 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 very tame in how it looks at things, and very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, Bad. Yeah, bad. <laughs> very, <laughs> very, very bad in how it... See, this, this is the thing. World War Z, if they just went... And tried to do it as a series of interviews with people who'd survived the war. And it was told in kind of... Right, on Literary Loitry, we've done uh, anthologies of post-apocalyptic sci-fi stories. Mm. Wastelands, mm. they're called, right? Uh, are the most yeah. prominent ones that we've done. And World War Z is kind of like that, right? Uh, the interviews are told in first-person perspective. There is no... Uh, you know, I don't remember a character called Jerry Lane being in there at all. Uh, I remember some very important characters, uh, like the film director, who's kind of like Steven Spielberg, explaining why they had to lie during the early days of the war against the zombies, um, yeah. because it was something that was needed. They had to reassure people. They couldn't have people panicking, and so they had to reassure them with all this propaganda that everything was going to be okay. Yeah. Right? And it, you could take any of the stories from World War Z, the book, and put them into the real world, and they would fit, right? Mm. World War Z, the movie, on the other hand, yes. aside from Brad Pitt's scarf, none of it can really fit. It's it, it's very much a fantasy that was that's come up from. I don't know. It it does seem like the mind of a thirteen year old child <laughs> who plays far too many video games and <laughs> needs to get out more, have a bit more exercise, maybe not socially distance themselves. From other people. Because, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, there are some scenes in the movie, right, where you look at it and go, that's cool. Yeah? Yeah. There are yeah. some <clears throat> scenes where you go, that's really cool. But then you there are other scenes where you go, are you all dumbasses? I mean, the scene in Israel where people are going, where Israel has built a wall and then everyone's in there and then everybody suddenly starts singing at the top of their voices and you're going, no. You know by now, you know by now that they're attracted to noise. Why are you all singing at the top of your voices? Yeah, it was quite wise of them to avoid that scene in the Quiet Place movies, wasn't it? (laughs) Exactly. Quiet Place movie 2, even quieter now. (laughs) You know, things like that. I mean, and the speed of the virus as well. Because, I mean, uh, in the book, the virus is a lot like the coronavirus we, we have right now. In that mm. people can be walking around with the zombie virus, not knowing they've got the zombie virus. Yeah. Right? But in the book, as soon as you're bitten, then that's it. You'll turn in a matter of minutes, hours, whatever. Which makes that scene where, uh, which makes the scene in the aeroplane where he has to cut off the Israeli soldier's hand so she's now handless, you know. That makes it more dramatic because it's a matter of minutes, and all of the all of the story in the in the movie takes place over a matter of weeks because it spreads like wildfire. We must have tension, tension, I tell you. Mm. And I'm sitting there watching this film, going, "I'm bored." <laughs> that was yes. cool. That was cool. Now I'm bored. Brad, you need to wash your scarf. <laughs> I like I said, it, it's one of those things where they really weren't brave enough with the source material they really i mean world war z is one of those books where if you have a courageous director who is willing to who's willing to put what's in the book onto uh you know onto the silver screen yeah and they're willing to i mean obviously there are going to be because there are going to be changes with adaptations you know that that's going to be that's a part that's a given you know yeah but wholesale ignoring the book (laughs) to make what to all intents and purposes, is a generic as hell zombie apocalypse film that might as well have had the zombie tsunami name Mm. instead of World War Z, right? Because what it means is that you've essentially paid, some studios essentially paid top whack for the rights to 
the idea of zombies. Yeah. Which isn't wise. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, there, there are things, there are bizarre things that happen. I mean, in North Korea, for example, um, in the film, it has not, mm. uh, oh, all North Korean people have had their teeth pulled so that when they turn into zombies, they can't bite you. Like, you do realise underneath the gums, there is bone that can hurt and bite through. <laughs> yes. And zombies kind of decay. So if they bite hard enough, they can, they can actually hurt you quite badly. But in the book, North Korea basically disappears. All of the people disappear. And the right. speculation is that they're all living underground to escape the zombie virus. Underground North Korea? Yeah. That's a whole movie right there. I mean, there's some weird parallels between the real world situation right now and uh, and the book. Um, mm. For example, Patient Zero is in China. <laughs> right. Um... You know, um, but aside from aside from the you know aside from those uh, weird parallels, the rest of it, I, I mean, just I don't ask for a lot when I when it comes to adaptations, right? I don't ask for yeah. a lot. All I ask for is that if you're going to use the name of something, at least bear some resemblance to it. I mean, as much yeah. as I slit the Super Mario Brothers movie, right? At least. They tried to have some kind of, you know, they had some relevance to the games, some relevance to, uh, to the actual franchise, the Mario Brothers franchise. They had, you know, Mario, Mario and Luigi Mario. They had Princess Zelda. They had certain other aspects that were similar. Even at one point, the costumes they wore were the same colors. There's some resemblance there, you know, yes. vague as it might be. You know, through through layers of pea soup fog, as it might be. But World War Z has literally no resemblance to the book. <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, it's like, uh, oh, wow. Uh, I don't know what to say about it. Go move on. I'm done. <laughs> am, I, am I right in thinking that David Fincher was attached to direct a sequel to World War Z? He was. Yes, he was. It does boggle the brain a little bit, that. It I, really does, yeah. I mean, I know he's well in with Brad Pitt, but Pitt must be a very good friend to persuade him to nearly get on board that. Right. I want to put I want to put this out there, right? I only discovered this particular film, not World War Z, this particular film, I only discovered it during uh, my research uh, about bad adaptations so I could decide which film I was going to cover. Right. Yeah. And then I found a film starring Raquel Welch that I have seen, but totally forgotten I'd seen, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a film directed by Michael Sarn, who at that point, do you know which film I'm talking about? <laughs> yes. It was a film directed by Michael Sarn, not Joanna, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a film based on a book by Gore Vidal. And yeah. <laughs> By the Breckenridge, yes. Is, uh, what we're heading for here is, and it? Yeah. I, I just want to point out. I just want to say that World War Z is a worse adaptation of a book than Myra Breckenridge. How have you forgotten that you saw Myra Breckenridge? Do you have therapy or something? My brain has a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> you know this, Graham. <laughs> it's why uh. I read all that trash fiction from <laughs> from overseas. <laughs> It's all an right. effort to forget. Hello, I'm Professor Elemental, and whenever I'm not riding a badger around my grounds or hitting my monkey butler with a stick, I'm listening to The Geek Show, and my God, I love it. So if you enjoyed what you're listening to, you can uh, donate to our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash The Geek Show. Or you can simply give us a like and a review. It really does help with our visibility on your podcast provider of choice. You can find us on Facebook, just search for The Geek Show. And we are on Twitter, TGS underscore The Geek Show. It's an impossible mission to talk about video games without upsetting someone. So join us at The Geek Show as we lean right into that. On Impossible Mission, we take two YouTube episodes and mush them into one seamless hole, on which we talk about happenings from the world of video games or something we just find cool. Formerly known as Press X, and born in you as Impossible Mission, join us as part of the Geek Show Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts from. 
if you do go to thegeekshow.co.uk, you can find some of our written reviews of films that we haven't had time to talk about on the show. Aiden will be doing a review of Distant Journey, the new second run title fairly yep. soon. Yep, very fair removed from the conquest that is Battlefield Earth, because Distant Journey is about the Holocaust. Yes, yeah. Um, so, a bit, bit of a left turn. Uh, we've also got The Specialists, a spaghetti western from the director of Django, starring Johnny Halliday. Yes, that Johnny Halliday. Mm. Uh, humans reviewed that one. And also, Matt Cunliffe has a review of Snowpiercer, the new uh, Lionsgate Blu ray edition, which is finally out in this country. Finally. So, for question of the week, there was only one thing that we could ask, and it's what's the worst adaptation you've ever seen? And I put this out slightly late, and I was worried that people weren't going to see it. But fortunately, uh, everyone who follows us on social media is really angry. Oh, that's not like the internet at all. (laughs) Yes. Uh, so on Twitter, Ashley Lane says, I'm still somewhat miffed about Visconti's Death in Venice. He is, and he wrote an excellent piece for the Geek Show website about why it was not the classic everyone thinks it is, which is well worth seeking out. On Facebook, Ian Payne says, he actually starts off with one of mine, uh, Bonfire of the Vanities was pretty atrocious. Ah, uh, yes, this is uh, Brian De Palma with Tom Hanks and Bruce Willis, wasn't it? Yes. Um, Based on, Mor- it was a Tom Wolfe, I think Tom, Tom Wolfe, Wolf. yeah. yeah. Then Morgan Freeman as perhaps the most miscast character I've seen uh, in a movie in all of my born days, playing a character who, in the novel, was a cynical racist judge, and in the movie... Well, everyone reacts to him the same way, but he's Morgan Freeman and he's really nice. <laughs> Bit of a miss. Uh, Ian also says they crucified the Lorax, which thinking about it would have been kinder than adapting it. <laughs> <laughs> And after The Hobbit, it's amazing anyone let Peter Jackson near a camera. <laughs> I, I like to think he never directed that Hobbit, Hobbit trilogy after The Lovely Bones. I just bleach it from my brain and just immediately think he jumped straight into They Shall Not Grow Old. I still scratch my head thinking about the fact that the big finale of the second movie where Smaug gets loose is resolved in literally about five minutes at the start of Battle of the Five Armies. And then the rest of it's just about a load of people you don't care about having a fight, and Billy Connolly turns up. <laughs> Absolutely mad. David Wood Golightly says, On the road, I don't know how they managed to make such a lifeless, limp, cold fish of it with the talent involved. I'd say Fair it's point. easy when it's Hollywood. Has anyone seen that Walter Sollers version of On the Road? No, no, I haven't. It's in a sort of impossible bind, because as soon as you make that novel into a period piece, you lose all of the energy of it. But if you made it as a present-day piece, it would just look like someone's gap year. (laughs) So it's probably unmakeable, but it is still kind of incredible that a movie directed by Walter Sauls, written by Francis Ford Coppola, and with Kirsten Dunst, Viggo Mortensen, Kristen Stewart, and Sam Riley in the cast, is such an absolute duffer. Well, it's kind of like, um, oh, what was it? Uh, I can't remember his name, but they made Ulysses. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like that version of Ulysses, where they really, you know, there's some bits of it that are great, Mm. but the rest of it is just, I don't know what you've done to this. (laughs) <laughs> I would love to be at the Hollywood pitch meeting when someone says, I've read this book Ulysses, I think it could make a good movie. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> a stream of consciousness novel being turned into a Hollywood movie. Hmm. No, never. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, Rob Simpson, uh, our regular call, says, The Japanese adaptation of Norwegian Wood from a few years back, a Haruki Murakami adaptation with all of the Murakami taken out. Yeah, I, I remember his uh, rant about Murakami adaptations on the Burning episode. <laughs> and I hate it, Burning. I quite like Norwegian Wood, I must admit, but I've never read any Murakami. I still haven't. I should get no. around to it. Oh, no. You but my only burn. experience is burning and burning. I, I totally agree. <laughs> it's so boring. 
uh, Oliver Lewis said, I misread that as worst adoption and thought it was a bit harsh to name and shame. <laughs> <laughs> but then he says, also, it was probably League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Now, is oh. he talking about adaptation or adoption there? It's not clarified. See, I don't, oh. I don't know. Um, maybe if you, if you, you know, ran a foster home, and you had like, <laughs> <laughs> let me adopt my new pet. His, his, his species is quite rare, but I think he's called Alan Moore. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm the just thinking. I'm just thinking. You've got, you've got like five or six teenagers, and you start. You basically right. You're Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. <laughs> <laughs> It is quite apt because League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is the unloved child of Alan Moore adaptations. Every other one, even Constantine, seems to have someone who says, ah, "Actually, it's really good, but not that." Was Constantine? No. Was Constantine? Uh, was Constantine Alan Moore? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Are you sure? Constantine's Hellblazer, isn't it? I don't know how many more times I can say "yep." Okay. I did not. <laughs> No, I, it's just, I, I've read a lot of Hellblazer and I did not yeah. know it was an Alan Moore creation. Created by Alan Moore, yeah. It's been picked up by a load of different people afterwards. It's probably had more of an afterlife than a lot of his stuff in that particular way. But yeah, Alan Moore created him. Oh, right. Okay, cool. Mark Lawrence says, The David Lynch version of June is both a terrible adaptation in that none of the plot themes really survive. Some changes seem to only make things more difficult to understand. And also an amazing one, because it's really weird. Yeah, I'm, I'm very hesitant of uh, Denis Villeneuve's adaptation later on in the year. Yeah, I, I sort of think it, it will make people who are already obsessed with June very happy, but it won't have that kind of mad spark that attracted people like Lynch or Hodorowsky to the project. Mm. See, this is the thing. Uh, having read the book and watched the film adaptation and the other adaptations of the other books, like Children of June, um, mm. I'll be honest, I don't mind the original version of June, the the movie. I, I quite like it. I think that the different, you know, I think that given how, given that it's got some similarities to the book, but there are enough differences to have it as kind of, you look at it and you go, okay, yeah, I get it. I get why they've done it like this. I can sort of see that. I admit I find it bothersome as more of a Lynch fan than a Frank Herbert mm. fan. Mm. Uh, and if you think that's controversial, Giles Lewis says, Perhaps the Kiva Knightley Pride and Prejudice, it's just a bad, tedious film, leaving aside comic book adaptations because, well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mikey Toes says The Turning, which was out earlier this year, based on Turn of the Screw. Thank the gods of Gallifrey, I have a cinema card, so technically did not spend a tenner to say this. See this, rather. Yep. Mark Harrison says, the only thing I'd add to the deserved Hobbit trilogy pile-on is that you don't get to turn one book into three movies, one of which elongates a battle that's a distracting trifle on the page to a full feature, and have that one be about the dangers of greed. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of uh, I think it was Robbie Collins review when he first put that review out and says um, in response to the desolation of smog yeah there's an awful lot of desolation before you get to the smog <laughs> yes <laughs> Uh, he also notes, as a defender of Jackson's maligned adaptations of King Kong and the Lovely Bones, I have no qualms whatsoever about calling The Battle of the Five Armies his worst film, and I completely agree. Yep. Uh, and finally, our regular co-host Mick Snowden says, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, completely miscast and missing every single beat that made the source material so engaging. When a film's best performance comes from Rihanna, you are on shaky ground, and I love Luc Besson movies usually. Mm. Again, I, I I completely agree with Mick. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pouring aside from anything else. I thought. Uh, so yeah, around the table, Aiden, do you have any others that still burn with you? Mm, there's one that I could think of, and it was a film I think I covered it as the worst of whatever year it was released uh, on mm. the show before. 
But we've picked on Dave Eggers before, haven't we, Graham? Oh, definitely, yeah. I yeah. think when we did uh, Hologram for the King. Yeah, and um, this is his adaptation of, I think, I think it was one of his later books, but who cares? Um, it's <laughs> it's The Circle, um, the film where Emma Watson gets indicted into a big, massive global corporation headed by Tom Hanks, and she has to find a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> So boring and lifeless. Um, yeah, the problem with that film that I had with it is just that it, it, it completely, in the same way that you disagree with men, women, and children, Graham, mm. it just completely mismanages the internet into like there's a very narrow minded viewpoint. Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. really have enough substance to say about it anyway. So you have like, and you have like the most miscast production that you ever seen in my life from actors ranging from, you know, actors who are pretty much very much like, you know, Tom Hanks, John Boyega, Karen yeah. Gillan, Bill Paxton is in it wow. as well in one of his yeah. final roles which is heartbreaking yeah um and it, it, it just completely drops all of that and then you just end up with sequences that you know how does this relate to the internet for example um when uh, Ella Coltrane from uh, boyhood boyhood yeah that's the thing where he gets and it's mild spoilers for the circle but I don't care anyway where he gets <laughs> cha- where he gets chased off the if i remember correctly chased off a bridge and falls to his grisly death by fangirls over some twitter feed um what it's yeah it's just completely bonkers in that regard but it just is completely subsided by these subplots that just don't have any substance. And then you have like other elements where Beck makes a cameo, for example, for some reason. <laughs> um, he, he is Beck. He is Beck. Yeah, Beck, the singer songwriter, as giving in, Loser <laughs> Beck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, Loser Beck, where he gives off a single of his then hottest album. It's just like, eh. That, wow. Uh, that sounds like it is not where it's at at all. Yeah, <laughs> D- from D- from the novelist who wrote such classic novels as a staggering work of genius. <laughs> also, I just want to come back to a, a comment you made at the beginning there, Aiden. Graham, do you really disagree with men, women, and children? Now, I don't mean do the film. Mean... I mean, I mean literally, because <laughs> that's what it's yeah, like. Yeah, if, if you meant the film, I would say yes, and if you meant the whole of society, I would also <laughs> say yes. I mean, especially what's happened in this country, dear God. <laughs> yes, I just want to throw in something before we have Rob's list of adaptations he hates to fade. Oh yes, I just want to note that. A, a quote-unquote bad adaptation can sometimes be a joy. There are some adaptations which get almost everything about the book they're adapting completely on its head and somehow turn out something beautiful on the other end. I mean, if you look at something like There Will Be Blood, yeah. which has mm. o- almost nothing, not even the title from the Upton Sinclair novel it's based on, and yet oh. you'd have to be an absolute idiot to argue that that makes it bad. Yeah, the mm. classic example is also Louis Bunuel's version of Belle de Jure as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. where he sat down with Jean-Claude Carrier, looked at the book and said, this is terrible, isn't it? And Carrier agreed, so they went and did their own thing. Hmm, yeah. My personal favourite wildly unfaithful adaptation is a version of Donald Westlake's classic crime novel, The Jugger, which is one of a series he wrote about Parker, the ex-con anti-hero who's been played on uh, screen by actors like Jason Statham, Lee Marvin, Mel Gibson. I think you can get a picture from those three actors of what kind of character Parker is, right? Hmm. Parker has also been played by Anna Karina. Oh. In Jean-Luc Godard's version of The Jugger called Made in USA, where Parker is now an investigative journalist whose ex-lover was a Marxist professor who is now at the centre of a bizarre conspiracy involving hitmen called McNamara and Nixon. The plot, even considering that, you know, Westlake's novels are pretty good, Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, very good, the plot is nevertheless almost completely incomprehensible, but it doesn't matter at all because this is one of those 60s Godard films that is just an exercise in gorgeous colour, political skits, Marianne Faithful on the soundtrack and long close-ups of Anna Karina looking pensive. 
it is an absolute joy, one of my favourite Godars. It has almost nothing to do with the Viking of Donald Westlake, and it's great. Cool. So, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, prepare for so, the tsunami. <laughs> just, I'm just cracking my knuckles. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I just want to say, right, mm. I, it was difficult for me to choose one adaptation that... God, God was it ever. Yeah, you know, um, but I didn't actually make a list on purpose. It just kind of happened. Because I thought <laughs> of one... And then another one would pop into my head, and, um, uh, and my brain uh, was saying, no, you can't leave this off. You have to tell them about this one as well. Maybe they've forgotten about this one. What about this one? Because that's how things go. So I started off with Nicolas Cage's mandolin, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, to give it its proper name, Captain Crowley's mandolin. But it's yes, the, the, Cage. The, yeah. the great Italian actor that is Nicolas Cage. <laughs> yes, the great the great mandolin player, Nicolas, <laughs> <laughs> Nicolas Cage. Before we move on to Joey Tribbiani's Lost in Space. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, that's, uh, yeah. Also with night. Gary Oldman. Yes, One again. Keep tapping. Yep. The, uh, as I phrased it, the eldritch monstrosity that Mike Myers becomes in The Cat in the Hat. <laughs> <laughs> in fairness, no longer the scariest human-cat hybrid we've seen in cinema. No, no, no. It no, has been no. superseded by Jason Derulo. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, obviously, uh, there's 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 fantastic because you can't yes. call it anything else. Because hey, the, oh. guy, the guy who did fantastic just released a new movie, and he's been like drumming it into people so much over the past four years that his version of fantastic was great, and the studio just didn't understand his genius. And now everyone's quite surprised that the movie is apparently bad. <laughs> Has he been walking yeah, around? I, I, last... I don't have a lot of I don't have a lot of faith in Josh Trank, to be perfectly honest with you. Has he been walking around going, "There is no victor, only doom"? <laughs> uh, I mean, this one had to make the list, right? Street Fighter, the movie, the video game. If you're gonna do a, ba- a list of bad adaptations, that has to be on there somewhere, because yes, completely. You know, uh, Jean Claude Van Damme. <laughs> <laughs> and Ronald <laughs> Julia is M. Bison, if I yeah, remember correctly. Who was actually remarkably good in the role. And I in think, his last step of yes. yeah, the Yeah. The weird thing was, it, sadly, it was his last ever role, but he was brilliant mm. in the role. But then you've yeah. also got Kylie Minogue. <laughs> <laughs> she pops up Great in pitch. some bizarre films. Oh, God, yes. Holy um, Motors. Holy Motors. <laughs> yeah. The CG Yogi Bear movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> God, <laughs> all of oh, those yeah. childhood memories of uh, picnic baskets and uh, what's up, boo boo? They they died horribly. They died screaming. <laughs> yeah, Holly, Hollywood. There, there was a run of those in like the early noughties about CG uh, animated like kids movies. You have yeah. also like the James Gunn Pen Scooby Doo movies and um, yeah, they, oh, what else they, is there? You know, way oh. to kill, way to kill my childhood, Hollywood. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Garfield as well with Bill Murray. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't just don't 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 keep going. You just bring up all <laughs> sorts of horrible memories. Um, so yeah, uh, who can forget the 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 brilliant sports star turned actor Shaquille O'Neal, <laughs> <laughs> who took on the role of a little known DC comic book character called Steel, who is basically a kind of replacement for Superman when Superman kind of got killed by Doomsday during the 90s in that mm. thing that DC said was, no, he's going to stay dead this time, but actually turned out to him being mostly dead. Mm. <laughs> this I mean, literally... yeah, okay, Steel is bad, but the Snyder Cut of Steel is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then we, uh, that brought me on to Halle Berry. <laughs> I saw yeah. that in the cinema. <laughs> and, I saw that on ITV when I was <laughs> young, much younger. And when we're talking about, you know, depict humans depicting cats on screen. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, what is it about cats that they get all this shoddy treatment? Because I, I, th- I think Catwoman was kind of the first attempt at, you know, may, uh, at the, at, the you know the movie version of cats 
because they said, yeah, <laughs> she's she she's part cat. So you have to act like a cat, Hallie, which means, you know, yeah, uh, lick your hand and rub your face and maybe, you know, maybe not cough up a hairball. <laughs> she went to a bar and ordered a saucer of milk. That's <laughs> literally a thing that's in the film. Exactly. I mean, if she had started coughing up hairballs, I would have been highly disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, that film where I, I literally had to had to write it like this: the film where dragon is spelled with an e instead of a d. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> which is itself basically a knockoff of Star Wars. I hear. Yes, it is. Uh, who could forget? Well, who who actually went to watch Jack Black's version of Gulliver? <laughs> 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 The film that went down in history is stopping Emily Blunt from being Black Widow. Yep. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> and, How uh, tragic. Yeah. Obviously, uh, we've mentioned Super Mario Brothers and The Hobbit enough times, but uh, uh, Wing Commander is one I want to pay special attention to, very special attention to, because the guy who directed the Wing Commander movie was the mm. guy who also created the video game Wing Commander. Right. right. And, right, you take this uh, video game franchise you've created, where mm. you have humans versus uh, this alien species called the Kilrathi, and it's it's deep, it's complex, it's got space battles galore, it's got all sorts of missions, and it's got all sorts of uh, dialogue, which is really well acted, and has Mark Hamill in, one, uh, in a couple of them, right? Mm. Uh, and it's really well acted with full motion video, and it's basically like, it's the closest you get into playing a movie in a video game, you're playing through this epic storyline, through four games, five games, and you're basically fighting for the survival of humanity. Mm. And you reduce that to uh, two ace fighter pilots, Freddie Prince Jr. and Matthew Willard, <laughs> <laughs> that's a cast list that screams this was made in the turn of the millennium isn't it yeah but it was directed by the guy who created the game you're like you made the games <laughs> you yeah. created this how did you where did you what were you smoking <laughs> <laughs> the perfect catch which is one of those uh, American attempts at doing something that's very very British in this case a Nick Hornby book about football, right? Um, so yeah, and obviously, as I, uh, as I said, Bat Nimbles isn't on the list because there's an argument that it is a very comic book movie. <laughs> <laughs> While you were still learning how to spell your name, so wow, that's uh, that's everything I could have dreamed. Bad adaptations would be. Thank you both. Next week, we're doing something a bit special again. We're doing We Are One, which is a global online film festival on YouTube. I'm not sure if the lineup's been announced yet, but uh, we are going to be covering that. But mm. until next week, with that, that's been your lot from Cinema Eclectica. I've been Graham. I've been Aiden. And I've been Rob. See you next week. Also, Tom Hanks is a mullet in the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> Stop there. Leave that in. Leave that in. <laughs> <laughs>